We bout to party Unrestricted Got the house now We gon' turn it up Up, bring the house down Got that big space pump And make them bounce now Flossing like they bossing And the freaks are coming out now This is AEW Unrestricted I am Will Washington I am joined by Aubrey Edwards How you doing, Aubrey? I'm good uh, Hey, Mr. Statsman A pay-per-view's coming up What number pay-per-view is it? Oh, uh... You know what? No, don't look it up. Don't look at your no, computer. I, I, I don't, don't know, cheat. actually. Yeah, I what? know. I know. The funny How thing was because I, I had it right in front of me. Yeah, I actually don't know. Uh, it's 29. <laughs> is it 29? I think it's 29 because I think Double oh. or Nothing was 28. Okay. All right. That's. I like you're just blindly believing me. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, I could have said it was 37, that. but you were like, oh, whatever. <laughs> anyway, happy 29th pay-per-view. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in the era of like four pay per views a year, I like always had the count. But then it was like once we increased, I. But you know what? That's a good thing. It's a good it thing is. that we've increased the amount of opportunities for people. And Forbidden Door is another one of those opportunities. And by the way, Happy Pride Month! Yes. I realized right before this show that I hadn't gotten to wear this shirt on the show yet, and I realized I had to do it. So right uh, here we are. It was one of those like Speedy did a bunch of uh, Pride photo shoot stuff with the LGBTQ talent backstage, and I just got a photo that earlier this week that I posted. I was like, "Oh, June's almost over." Yeah. Like almost forgot. <laughs> Not like you can't celebrate Pride all year long, but there's something about doing it in June in particular. <laughs> right. Exactly. And then, and then, like I said. It was one of those. I've worn this shirt on the show pretty much all year, but I realized, oh, I have not worn it in Pride Month, and I should wear it. So, period. I are. wore the Forbidden Door shirt. That's a dope shirt. I have that shirt in a drawer, and I was thinking about pulling that out, and I thought, I bet you Aubrey's going to wear it, so therefore, hey. I should not. But hey. Forbidden Door, it's an incredible time every year. Uh, this is the third Forbidden Door. That's that I've got correct. Hey. And I've been at every Forbidden Door. Look at that. If you're watching the video version, the poster from the first one's right here. Uh, but it is a co-production of New Japan Pro Wrestling and All Elite Wrestling. It is the one time a year that we get to come together to put the show together. But for the first time, we also have other promotions joining in the fold as well. We've got some representation from Stardom. We've got representation from CMLL. This is going to be an awesome show. I'm really looking forward to it. And I think there's no better way to start off talking about this card than actually with the AEW World Championship, which I know some people have looked at this match and gone, now wait a second, this is two AEW guys. <laughs> um, and uh, we're talking about the AEW World Championship being defended, AEW's World Champion Swerve Strickland defending the title against AEW International Champion Will Ospreay. But when you think about Forbidden Door, there is only one man who I think truly embodies the forbidden door mm -hmm. and that is will osprey he Thank is you. the forbidden door when you think about the first forbidden door this man stealing the show with orange cassidy and how can will osprey actually steal the show when the show almost belongs to him 90 percent of the time but at the same time there was so much else on that card that nobody was expecting that match to be the match and that was one of my matches of the year in 2022 and then last year of course the expected rematch with kenny omega and we knew they were going to deliver and those guys tore the house down forbidden door belongs to will osprey and i can't think of a better person to represent forbidden door in the main event than as the challenger for the aew world championship but he's got his hands full against a world champion who's really just getting started in swerve strickland here at forbidden door i think this match is going to be amazing these two have so much history together and i mean you go back almost 10 years with these guys they've wrestled up and down the independent scene they are legitimately very close friends and you know, this was one of those matches that I think everybody knew they were going to see at some point. I don't think Forbidden Door was what people were expecting. And yet here it is right in front of us. One of the biggest matches, if not the biggest match AEW could offer at this point. Aubrey, how are you feeling about Will Ospreay and Swerve Strickland? I think what I feel going into this match is I have no idea who's who's going to win. Like we've seen Swerve Strickland be a completely dominant champion. He was dominant in the ring prior to becoming champion. Like just his match with Hangman will forever be like seared in my brain in a loving way despite, you know, all the blood everywhere. But at the same time, has Will Ospreay lost a match since he joined AEW officially? No, he has not. Exactly. So it's like this could go either way. But Swerve Strickland has not been pinned this year either. And so That's true. That's true. 
And part of it too is that like we've seen sort of Strickland in AEW for a long time, but we've also seen Will Ospreay in AEW before he was a part of AEW. Like Will Ospreay, before he even worked for us, was wrestling at Wembley. (laughs) He is the true epitome of Forbidden Door because any door that's there, Will Ospreay's like, hey, bruv, I'm going to just walk through it. Like (laughs) he's that guy. But the person that is going to win in this match is the AEW fandom, the New Japan fandom. Anyone watching this match, they're going to win because this is going to be incredible. Absolutely. I, I, I can't think of... Uh, I, I can't think, really, of a better main event for Forbidden Door. I think that when... You know, one of the things Swerve talked about was the fact that he was on the zero hours of the first two Forbidden Doors, that he didn't get to participate in the main card of either show. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, Will Ospreay was the guy at both Forbidden Doors, and Swerve spent the last year really building himself up and getting to the point of becoming the AEW World Champion, and now he's got the chance to not just be on the Forbidden Door card, but he's in the main event defending the AEW World Championship, but it's against a guy who has been making a very strong name for himself in AEW, and uh, he just won the International Championship. The question of can he carry the weight of both worlds on his shoulders that's a thing that's in question, but we at least physically saw when he snatched the belt from Swerve just a couple weeks ago that he at least believes he can. And I think the AEW fans believe it. There's very few wrestlers in this world where they could be a part of a company for just a handful of months and already win one belt and conceivably win the biggest title at the company. And Will Ospreay is that guy, without question. Like, it, it makes sense on paper, it makes sense on billboards, it makes sense everywhere. But at the same time, Swerve Strickland is just an absolute dominant wrestler. And this match is going to be incredible. Absolutely is. Also on the card, by the way, you know, last month we saw a really unfortunate injury at Double or Nothing in which we saw Adam Copeland, the former TNT champion, uh, sustain an injury inside a steel cage match with Malachi Black. And uh, as a result of that injury, he had to vacate the TNT championship. So we have... Well, no, 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 no. He did not vacate... The executive vice presidents, Matthew and Nicholas Jackson, forced him to vacate the title. Let's give credit where it's due because Adam was a wonderful yes, champion. Uh, absolutely. He was a phenomenal champion. I think that what he was doing with that belt, the run he was on with that belt, nothing short of incredible. And I, I also just was- don't want to get fined, so I want to make sure that our executive vice presidents are, you know, uh, the work that they do for us is yes, properly attributed. very true. And so what's interesting is with the belt being vacant, uh, and it's very rarely been in that situation. We've rarely ever had belts vacated in AEW. They have been, but it's it's very rare that we've seen that happen. And so uh, this introduces an incredibly uh, unique situation for AEW, and we've got to crown a new TNT champion. And the field in this match is made for ladder matches. When you think about Mark Briscoe and some of the the latter warfare he's had with his brother. And when you think about guys like guys like Dante Martin, a man who mm-hmm. made a name for himself in ladder matches, he's an uh, extreme high flyer. He also sustained an injury in a ladder match and I think has something to prove here. Uh, you think about Leo Rush, somebody who, again, is extremely fast-paced, fast-moving. He's got so much speed and agility that it is almost tailor-made for being a part of a ladder match. But then you've got Kanosuke Takeshita. And Kanosuke Takeshita, excuse me, has, uh, he's got the strength, he's got the size, he's got the power. And that is something that you want to see in a ladder match. But he's also got that speed and agility as well that also lends itself to a ladder match. Then you've got Jack Perry, a guy who also, not a stranger to ladder matches, not a stranger to ladder matches in Mm -hmm. AEW. And a man who was about to be handed the TNT championship until Christopher Daniels stepped in and made sure that that wasn't going to happen. But when you think about all of these guys combined, this to me makes for the perfect combination for a ladder match in AEW. So as a fan, I love ladder matches because you get all these different guys who have different wrestling styles and different backgrounds, different histories, whether or not they've crossed paths. And you basically just throw them in a hardware store uh, combined with a wrestling ring And all hell breaks loose. And it's fantastic. As a referee, uh, I am not a fan (laughs) because they they are brutal. They are awful. I have seen 
horrible things happen close in because people are fighting literally for their lives with hardware. And it's one thing to say like someone really, really wants a title, but I think we see that primal nature of wanting to get that title when you have a situation like a ladder match. And I think it does something in people and it brings out a different side of each of these competitors. Like I love Mark Briscoe. He's loving, kind-hearted, wonderful guy. The moment you throw him in a ladder match, you're you're in for it. Like, oh. <laughs> ah, man, I am so excited for this one. It's it's one of those matches that most would look at and feel is incredibly difficult to call. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think any one of these guys has made their case they are. for becoming TNT champion. And no, I think it's an exciting time. And I think this is going to be one of those matches that that probably goes out of its way to steal the show. And uh, I think mm -hmm. every one of these guys has something to prove here. Another match happening on this card that, you know, part of the allure of Forbidden Door is the dream match, the match that people didn't think we could see. And so when I think about dream matches and when I think about the run that Shingo has been on in New mm -hmm. Japan Pro Wrestling for just this last, I mean, it, not just the last year, but um, really in the last few years, but especially this year, the run that Shingo's been on. And to know that in Brian Danielson's final year as a full-time professional wrestler, Brian Danielson steps in the ring with Shingo in a match in the opening round of the Owen Hart Foundation Cup Tournament. One of these men will be going on to the second round on a quest to main event AEW All-In Wembley. Brian Danielson, look, he has been killing it this year. But as he mentioned, in his path of killing it, he hasn't exactly been winning. That, you know, mm -hmm. when you look at his first pay-per-view match of the year, he faced Eddie Kingston for the Continental Championship, did not secure the victory. At Dynasty, he faced Will Ospreay in one of the best matches AEW has ever seen, but he did not get the victory. Anarchy in the Arena was just that. It was Anarchy, uh, Team AEW, the Elite, head-to-head -head in a match that Brian Danielson extremely familiar with, mm -hmm. but he did not get the victory. And at this point, Brian Danielson has everything to lose going forward. This is not how Brian Danielson wants his career in AEW to end. And he has a goal of making it to all in. He has a goal of making it to Wembley and becoming the AEW world champion. But in order to do that, he has to get through Shingo. It's kind of shocking that we're almost a year after, I can't remember exactly, you probably know the exact time and place that it happened, but when Brian said this was his last year as a full-time wrestler. It was last October, yeah. There you go. It's it's We're coming up on that year now. And I think all of us are kind of looking at this going, oh, oh, oh no. Like Each time we see Brian wrestle now, like this might be the last time that he wrestles in that state. I was actually just talking to my friends this past weekend when they came up to Everett. They're like, yeah, Brian gave a speech at the end of the show. Like, well, and I kind of explained the whole thing. Like, they're very casual wrestling fans, but to know what this kind of means to Brian's career, like there's so much happening in this match. There's just Brian, who he is as a wrestler, who he, who he means to wrestling in general. There's the chance to main event all in Wembley. There's the fact that there's the opening match for the Owen Hart Cup tournament which is an incredible, incredible partnership that we have with the Owen Hart Foundation. There's so much in this that it's easy to lose sight of this one pure moment of, oh, this might be the last time we get to see Brian Russell as a full-time wrestler in New York. It's kind of crazy. And, and one of the things is, you know, we're talking so much about Brian, but also Shingo. Again, talking about what Shingo has been able to accomplish here in AEW. And not just in AEW, sorry, but what he's been able to accomplish in New Japan Pro Wrestling this year, I think has been nothing short of remarkable. Uh, an incredible match with Gabe Kidd just about a month ago, a month and a half ago. He has been doing some incredible work. I think Shingo is on one of the best runs of his career. And to be in there with Brian Danielson, I think is a dream match that so many people didn't think they'd get to see. And I, it was on a lot of people's fantasy cards. You would see like, oh, when, mm. Bri when Brian Danielson works New Japan, who would you like to see him wrestle? And like Shingo was one of those names Shingo. you just kept seeing. And for Shingo to have the opportunity to face Brian Danielson, possibly beat Brian Danielson, and to get to move on to the second round and possibly get to also go to Wembley. I mean, that's, that's a dream scenario as well. This is one of those matches that, again, 
This is what Forbidden Door is all about. This is why we have Forbidden Door. You get to see some incredible face-to-face -face matchups that you possibly would not ever get to see. This is an exciting time. It's great. And I love all the weeks leading up to Forbidden Door and introducing all these amazing talent to our fan base. Like I got to work with Shingo when he faced uh, AR Fox on Rampage, which was just not really being super familiar with Shingo, having seen some of his stuff, but then seeing him beat the living shit out of Air Fox up close, I'm like, oh, oh, this match with Brian's going to be real good. Yes, <laughs> and we've got so much more Forbidden Door to talk about. It's happening this Sunday live. It is in Elmont, New York City. It is, I guess, technically Long Island, uh, however you want to look at that. But on Long Island, you want to be there, UBS Arena. AEWTix.com is the way to be in the house for this show. But you also don't want to miss it from the couch of your home, no. the center of your home, however you no. decide to watch it on your mobile device. Uh, however you're going to watch the show, you want to watch the show. It's available on traditional pay-per-view. It's available on PPV.com. It's available on Bleacher Report. It's available on YouTube. Uh, any way you can watch this show. Uh, oh, and also uh, Triller as well. Uh, any way yes. you can watch this show, you should be a part of it. Forbidden Door, it's this Sunday. We've got so much more to talk about right here when AEW Unrestricted continues. AEW Unrestricted, it's Aubrey and Will. We're talking Forbidden Door, which is live this Sunday. It's traditional pay-per-view it is bleacher report it is triller it is ppv.com it is youtube uh it is live at ubs arena aewtix.com you want to be there we're talking about the card and in talking about the car we got to be talking about the aew women's world championship on the line yes tony storm defending the belt against a woman who i believe has been taking the world no pun intended by storm by storm uh and uh, i think <laughs> She has been, you know, everybody who comes across, Mina Shirakawa, I think just falls in love from the standpoint of she just commands the screen in a way that I don't think a lot of people understood that she had the ability to, unless you were a stardom fan. I don't think you were necessarily of a full understanding of what she brought to the table, but a big part of Mina's story, of course, is the fact that she is a part of the group E Nexus V, which also had a previous name, Club Venus. And another member of Club Venus was one Mariah May. And Mariah May, now the protege of Tony Storm. I appreciate that the graphic for this has Mariah in both corners because at the end of the day, she <laughs> is tied. <laughs> she is tied to both. Uh, she is very loyal to Mina Shirakawa, but at the same time, Tony Storm uh, has very much taken a shining, a liking to Mariah May and has taken her under her wing in a way that, you know, over these last eight months. Under her wing, think... on her bosom, you know, yep. it, it's, uh, she... it's all kind of awkward. <laughs> and <laughs> for the AEW Women's World Championship to be on the line here, this is a match that I remember when it was first hinted at. Uh, it was back in April. Mm. at the stardom show and yes in philadelphia in philly <laughs> yes in philly and we saw a reunion of our club venus members of mina shirakawa and uh mariah may and then out came tony storm and tony storm talked about a forbidden door possibly being open and that crowd erupted they knew exactly what they wanted to see they wanted to see mina shirakawa taking on tony storm for the aew women's world championship and to get to see this match now and again, it all comes down to me, I believe, where Mariah May's loyalties lie. It's always interesting having, you know, that that third person on the outside, right? But Mariah is friends with both of these competitors. And this is such a unique situation where, you know, as you kind of said, like there's history with Mina, but who Mariah is now and all of the acclaim that she's getting now is 100% due to Tony Storm. And it's not lost on Mariah. She understands that there's, you know, connection with both of them. But at the same time, like, everybody loves Mina. Like, now that she's been around our locker room enough, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, it's cool. I, I could see her as my champion. This is fine. I get it. But at the same time, I watch these Tony Storm promos where she is just losing her mind a little bit more every week. 
And the idea of Tony Storm one day not being women's champion makes me sad <laughs> because I'm just so entertained by this iteration of Tony Storm. She's so fantastic. So independent of the actual wrestling, because we didn't talk about the wrestling aspect. We're just talking about like who they are as people. Like it's every time you have all three of these on screen, it's just there's so much charisma. There's so much love. There's so much sex appeal. There's so much everything. And it's so unique to any other match on the card. I'm so thrilled about this matchup. One of the things that I think is is really cool here is the fact that it's a full circle moment for so many people involved. If you've been following Tony Storm's career uh, a very long time, then there's a good chance you were introduced to her in stardom in that she wrestled in stardom way back in 2016. And, uh, you know, really, uh, I would say sharpened her tools in stardom. And, you know, Mariah May talks about the fact that, you know, she was a big fan of Tony Storm. Tony Storm was her idol. And she really followed in the footsteps of Tony Storm in going to stardom. But in going to stardom, that was how she met Mina Shirakawa mm -hmm. and became close friends with her. So everything about this is such a long term story and how it all came together, how all of these elements fit together. And it is excellent to see that Tony Storm almost gets to return to her wrestling roots in getting to compete against one of Stardom's best in Mina Shirakawa. My favorite part of all this is if you've ever watched Stardom, you see that all of the women literally beat the shit out of each other. And it's so fun to watch. And I'm pretty certain we're going to get mm -hmm. that in this. And it's going to be really exciting. And also on the card, we've got in trios action, the formidable team of the AEW World Tag Team Champions, the EVPs, the Young Bucks, teaming with fellow elite member, AEW Continental Champion, Kazuchika Okada, to take on the very unlikely pairing of the acclaimed and New Japan Pro Wrestling President, Dude. Hiroshi Tanahashi. Dude. <laughs> I know, right? Like, you see this on paper, and it's just like, how can this be? If you had told me three years ago at the first Forbidden Door that this would eventually be a match we see, I would have told you you were absolutely insane, and there's no possible way. And there's so many things about this match that are just... Again, if you told this to me from just a couple years ago, I'd be like... No. No way. Like, the, the big thing being, of course, that Okada is representing all elite wrestling here. He's not representing New Japan Pro Wrestling. This is a man who is synonymous with New Japan Pro Wrestling for so long, but he represents AEW at this point. He is a part of the elite. He is the AEW Continental Champion. He says <laughs> bitch at every turn. And uh, this is a man who uh, has truly found his identity in AEW. And yet, even in doing so, he finds himself standing across the ring from one of his all-time greatest rivals in Hiroshi Tanahashi. Uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi, of course, teaming with the acclaimed. Oh, this is this is like, so good. Hiroshi, like we, we have a new daddy ass for a minute. Like this <laughs> is this is absolutely great. I, I I oh man, like I'm just I'm imagining like if they win, what the scissor party looks like and all of that. Just oh my god, yes. this is beautiful. I I love this so much. Just with. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> and, and when you think about the run the acclaimed have been on and the fact that they just got a victory over the AEW World Tag Team Champions. Yeah, you know, they won the Eliminator match. They have a future world title match. They, they have the Bucks number at this point. And so riding that wave of momentum, going up against the Bucks now in a trios match, and we're talking about the acclaimed who are two thirds of the longest reigning AEW trios champs of all time. And against the Young Bucks who are two thirds of uh, the only multi-time trios champions. And so when you think about these guys uh, everything going into this trios match here. This is a big deal. This is an important part of the card. And just knowing that Tanahashi and Okada get to once again square up. Two guys who, again, have so much history with each other. And it's all taken place outside of All Elite Wrestling. But for it to find its way into AEW, it's just, it's incredible. This is phenomenal. I mean, also don't forget when the Acclaimed won their tag titles, they were in New York. Sure, it was a different building, but we've seen how a New York fan base can come behind and really just bring these guys to to the place that they're trying to get to. So there, there's just that X factor. I don't know if, the, if Matthew and Nicholas are actually factoring that in or not. We are also going to get to see, again, going back to the dream matches, Orange Dude. Cassidy, who also <laughs> uh, 
I know, right? Uh, you know, one we of talked the, about the, Will Ospreay being like the face of Forbidden Door, but like it's really, it's really Orange Cassidy. <laughs> it it really is. I think that Orange Cassidy um, also very much fits the mold of Forbidden Door when you think about what Forbidden Door is, and you think about some of the biggest marquee matches the Forbidden Door has ever had. And you talk about that first year with Will Ospreay, like we talked about, but the opponent was Orange Cassidy. And it takes two to tango, and Orange Cassidy tore the house down. But last year, Orange Cassidy was defending the AEW International Championship in uh, that incredible run he had with the belt. And in that match, it was a four-way uh, between Orange Cassidy, AEW's own Katsuyori Shibata, Daniel Garcia, and Zack Sabre Jr. How did I not remember this until now? Oh my God, it all comes full circle. And so, uh, which was an incredible matchup. I think one of the underrated matches on that card. And for Orange Cassidy now to have, it felt like in that match, it wasn't quite over between Orange and Zack Sabre Jr. And here we have brought it back full circle, one-on-one. -on -one. Finally, Orange Cassidy up against Zack Sabre Jr. at Forbidden Door. Aubrey, how are you feeling? I am so stoked for this. Like, my favorite match I ever did was Brian Danielson and Zack Sabre Jr. at Russell Dream last year. And I've had the opportunity to work with Zack a couple times since then, and even before then. And he's a phenomenal wrestler. Brian will say himself, like, he does things that you just don't expect. Like, you could do all of the tape study in the world when you're faced in the ring with Zack Sabre Jr., and he'll still bend something into a pretzel shape that you've never even saw coming. You can't come up with a way to counter everything he has because he'll figure out some new way to counter it in that exact moment. At the same time, Orange Cassidy is pretty much the most unpredictable person because he shows up at the ring kind of apathetically, not really looking to wrestle anyway, but then will out-wrestle literally everybody. And both of them, like Zach, we know is an incredible technical wrestler, but Orange Cassidy has a great amount of technical wrestling acumen to him. I think this is actually a phenomenal matchup. I think the two of them have their styles. Like there, there's like a Venn diagram. There's the Orange Cassidy and the Zack Sabre Jr. And they overlap, I think, more than people realize. And, you know, um, Orange Cassidy, uh, you know, this is obviously a, a very important matchup to him. But when you think about everything that's going on with Orange right now and that he was just recently betrayed by his very close friends in <sighs> Chris Statlander. He was we betrayed have to by talk Trent. About them. And to think about... <laughs> To think about the fact, though, that, you know, that exists, right? And this is not an Orange Cassidy that we saw last year. He was very focused on retaining his international championship. This is an Orange Cassidy who's dealing with the loss of his best friends and, uh, and now has a very, very hungry Zack Sabre Jr. on his tail. And when you, you've got that shark in the water that can smell blood, I think that Zack Sabre Jr. could potentially have his number here. I think this is a good matchup. It, it's a great matchup. Everyone's going to have a phenomenal time watching this match. I'm I'm stoked. I hope I get it, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, too, actually. How can we watch this show, Aubrey? Oh, man, we can watch this show in so many different places. You should, if you're able to, watch it live, aewtix.com. You can watch it Sunday, this Sunday, at the UBS Arena in Elmont, New York, Long Island, New York. Whoever, if you're MJF, it's at Long Island. If you're anyone else <laughs> in Elmont, New York, you can watch it. Uh, on traditional pay-per-view. You can watch it on pbv.com. You can watch it on trailer.tv. You can watch it on uh, Bleacher Report. You can watch it on YouTube. There's so many different places to watch this pay-per-view. This is our, we think, the 29th pay-per-view we've ever done, and each one somehow gets better and better. If you are not watching this pay-per-view, you're wasting your time because this is the best thing you could be doing this Sunday. And we've got so much more to talk about coming up on AEW Unrestricted. AEW Unrestricted, we're talking about Forbidden Door, which during the break decided to do a count because we were going back <laughs> to the beginning of the show, we were talking about what number pay-per-view this was, and I didn't necessarily want to agree with certainty because there was a chance it could have been wrong, but we did it a count. Aubrey Edwards, this is the 28th pay-per-view coming up here. Correct. This is the 28th pay-per-view. Yes. I just wanted to, it doesn't matter what number it was. I just want to point out, I knew a stat that you didn't. <laughs> I thought I knew a stat that you didn't. <laughs> there you go. But now we both know that this is the 28th pay-per-view in AEW history. And it's very likely, uh, based on everything we've talked about so far, uh, going to be the absolute best one so far. Yeah. Uh, I think there's 
Look, we've got so much more to talk about on this card. This is Forbidden Door. It is live. It is this Sunday. AEWTix.com. You want to be there in person. Get those tickets on Long Island. On Long Island, excuse me. And the reason I bring up Long Island is because you can't talk (sighs) about an event on Long Island without talking about a man who made his return at the last pay-per-view, the 27th pay-per-view, apparently. Hey. The former AEW world champion, Maxwell Jacob Friedman is back in AEW, and he is back on Long Island, UBS Arena. I once told this man that UBS Arena belongs to MJF. Mm -hmm. When you really think about the fact that this is an arena that opened in 2021, AEW has run this venue more than anyone outside of... The Islanders. Outside of the Islanders. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so when you think about how AEW has run this venue as much as we have, and the fact is the one man who's been the poster child for every one of those events has been Maxwell Jacob Friedman, MJF. And here we are again. You couldn't have Forbidden Door on Long Island without MJF on the card. And he is going one-on-one with one of the best, greatest talents out of CMLL. Hetch Cero, a man who has recently formed an alliance with the Cage of Agony of Brian Cage and the Gates of Agony. Hetch Cero really making a name for himself in AEW and now finds himself going one-on-one with not just MJF, but all of the people of Long Island. I think at one point it was described that MJF returning to UBS Arena is a lot like Bret Hart going back to Canada. <laughs> like It does not matter what he's done. He receives a hero's welcome. Like yes. <laughs> that is when everyone likes. I don't know if Edgesero knows what he's walking into. Right. Unless you're there, which you should be there, live, AEWTix.com. Unless you're there when MJF comes out in New York, I, I don't think you can imagine it. Like how much he is seen as like a hero. And especially after everything he went through with the last year, defending his title, you know, historic reign, and then taking all this time off to just literally heal. And being injured. Like, we've seen him wrestle, I think, once since he came back. Yeah, against Roosh. Against Roosh. And Roosh hits really freaking hard. Yeah. (laughs) So, it's not like Max is really in a spot where he's at his best. Sure, we've got the people of New York behind him, but is he physically where he was the last time we were in New York? I don't know. I think Echicero's got a really interesting uh, scenario he's walking into. And it's always an interesting scenario with Max opposite anyone in UBS Arena or just on Long Island, period, because we did uh, Nassau Coliseum back for World's End. But nonetheless, Correct. it's always interesting, right? Because when you think about Max going up against Wardlow being face to face and Wardlow being an ex- extreme fan favorite at that point, but not against Max on Long Island. Nope. When you heard Max, of course, do his, uh, his big band performance on Long Island and, and Jack Perry, who at the time, huge fan favorite, not on Long Island. Then, you know, going up against Samoa Joe for the world title. Granted, Samoa Joe did walk out with the title. Joe was one who knew how to overcome Max and the people of Long Island. So that's not to say he's unbeatable in this environment. And I think Echicero, if anybody can, could find a way to defeat MJF on Long Island. And like I said, it's his arena. This this arena belongs to him. Mm-hmm. Echicero is going to be in for a fight, but I think that you know he has been proving time and time again in his time in AEW and some of the battles he's had in AEW, getting in the ring with some of the best that AEW has to offer. He definitely has something to prove to the AEW audience in being in there with somebody as high profile as Maxwell Jacob Friedman. This is going to be great. I've had the opportunity to work with Echicero a couple times as we've brought in luchadors from CMLL, and he's just such an incredible wrestler. He's quick. He's precise. He's hard-hitting. He's everything that I don't think Max is ready for. <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited to watch this one. Well, another match that a lot of people are looking forward to, including myself, is the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship on the line. The IWGP World Heavyweight Champion John Moxley defending against the man he defeated for the title, Tetsuya Naito. Naito, of course, looking to regain the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship and to do it this time. Of course, 
Moxley did it on their turf mm-hmm. when he won the title Windy City Riot just a few months ago. And to now be on, I would say, kind of equal turf because this is a, a production of AEW New Japan Pro Wrestling. It's an environment that is that AEW has traditionally run. And uh, for Moxley to be defending it again against Naito, you know, we talk about so much being needed to be proven here. But I think that in this case, it is one of those when you're going back to challenge the man who defeated you for a world championship, there is so much to prove because you have to prove as the defending champion that my win was not a fluke. You have to prove that I deserve to hold the championship that I am walking around with. And thinking about the fact that John Moxley has to do this against the man who most recently held that title, I think is a challenge in itself. But knowing the prestige that surrounds Tetsuya Naito and the fact that he is synonymous with New Japan Pro Wrestling, synonymous with the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship, uh, this again is the type of matchup where anything can happen. And I think Moxley is definitely going to be in for one of the biggest fights of his year. We were lucky enough to see Naito wrestle last year. It was one of the matches I did where it was him and Sting and Darby versus Jericho and his crew. And so Naito, the last time he was in Forbidden Door, got a win in his column. So this isn't unknown territory for him, per se, right? Like he's walking in, the fans already know who he is, the fans know what to expect. The legend of Naito is at least known. A lot of times we have guys coming in where it's the first time our fans are seeing with him. They're familiar. Moxley, however, is a living legend. He has the AEW fans behind him. He comes through the crowd. They cheer him constantly. But I feel like with everyone in the room, we all know that these are two legends coming together in the ring on, we can say, equal turf. I don't know who's walking out the champion, but I know that the the, the mystique of the IWGP title will continue to be that, whether Naito holds it or whether... Moxley hold it. 100% agree. But finally, <gasps> title for title, our TBS champion, Mercedes Monet, will put her TBS championship on the line. And she's going to be defending it one on one against the New Japan Strong Women's Champion, Stephanie Vacker. The interesting thing about this match is that the New Japan Strong Women's Championship, of course, was born uh, last May. And in a tournament to crown said champion, we saw two matches. Uh, One of those matches actually saw Stephanie Vacker competing to potentially become the New Japan Strong Women's Champion. And of course, Mercedes Monet competed as well. And Willow Nightingale competed. That tournament ended up being won by Willow Nightingale that night. And she walked away the first ever New Japan Strong Women's Champion. But that, of course, left the chip on the shoulder of one Mercedes Monet because a lot would say that that belt was created for her, Mm -hmm. that she felt like that belt was created for her, and she did not walk away with that championship. And that championship has since passed hands. It was held by Julia, and then uh, later on, it's now been held by Stephanie Vacker. And, of course, it has found its way full circle back to being in the crosshairs of Mercedes Monet, who just won the TBS championship. But apparently... That's not enough gold for Mercedes Monet. And she wants her hands on the New Japan Strong Women's Championship. But at the same time, Stephanie Vacker, I think, is one of the premier luchadoras in the world today. And what she brings to the table in any promotion she competes in, I think, always leaves an impression on people. And I think that for her to step into AEW in her first ever AEW pay-per-view performance win the TBS championship. That's the thing Mercedes Monet just did, right? That was her mm-hmm. first AEW match and she won the TBS title. To then lose it on her first pay-per-view defense against somebody making their first pay-per-view appearance. Oof. That's a poetic story. That's something mm-hmm. that even as a fan of Mercedes's, I would say I would very much be interested in seeing. There's a lot at play here. Like you said that there's you know, this title in theory was created for Mercedes, right? I feel like if 
Mercedes was presented with a thousand different titles. It wouldn't matter because this is the one that is in her crosshairs because there's a story that is still to be told. And I feel like she's the kind of person, and I've, I've been fortunate to work with her a couple times now. She knows what she wants and she gets it. And that is what Mercedes Monet is about. She's just phenomenal. At the same time, my introduction to Stephanie was the same tournament you were talking about. I was watching one of the matches. And in the middle of it, I just say, how do I work with this girl? She's phenomenal. Yes. She's an incredible champion. And could I see her being the face of TBS? Absolutely. You've seen, if you see her wrestle just a little bit, you understand like how absolutely incredible she is. So both of these women potentially being the face of two different companies. Have we ever had a title for title in a women's division in AEW before? No, we have not. We have had champions Ooh. competing against each other, but knowing that it's title for title and that somebody has to walk away with two championships. Somebody will walk away with two championships. Oh. This is an incredible moment. It's good. This is history. Guaranteed history is made here. Oh man. I like it's one of those things where it's just I'm I'm so excited to see this match play out. I have no idea how it's going to go. Either way, I'm just going to be pleasantly surprised because women's wrestling is the best it's ever been. And we're going to see an absolutely incredible match between both of these competitors. I think we're going to see an incredible show between everybody on this show. Hell yeah. I am so excited to be a part of this night, to be there on this night. I know you are. I know that every time I get to see you get to call a high profile match, I'm always like, that's my friend out there. I'm so excited for it. So I am looking forward to this and I know you are too. Oh, dude, I'm so stoked. I'm so stoked. And if you're not stoked, you should be because there are still tickets available. AEWTix.com. Come to the pay-per-view if you are in the New York area or even remotely close. It is worth a drive. AEW pay-per-views are phenomenal, stellar, well worth the money. Like, we're, we're practically giving them away. Like, you should just come to this thing. It's going to be great. So many incredible matches as we've, as we've profiled here. If you can't make it to New York this weekend, this Sunday, make sure you watch traditional pay-per-view, ppv.com, YouTube, Triller, Bleacher Report. There's all these different ways to watch it. Watch the action happen. Watch the history be made. Watch these incredible competitors from all over the world and all these different companies. Forbidden Door is just this wonderful celebration of wrestling. It doesn't matter who you work for or who you are representing. We all get to come together and just enjoy in our love of wrestling. And that's the thing I love most about Forbidden Door. I agree. And don't forget, beyond Forbidden Door, keep checking out this podcast, AEW yes. Unrestricted. Most of the time, we've got incredible guests on this show. And uh, you can check out new episodes of the show every Thursday on our traditional podcast feeds. However you get your podcast, AEW Unrestricted is there. You can also watch our beautiful mugs right on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, the AEW Unrestricted YouTube channel. You can watch AEW Dynamite every Wednesday on TBS. You can watch AEW Rampage every Friday on TNT. AEW Collision every Saturday night on TNT. Ring of Honor is available on Honor Club. Watch ROH.com. But otherwise, this has been AEW Unrestricted. I'm Will Washington. She is Aubrey Edwards. We'll see you next time. Have a great day. Peace. Come on, throw your hands up, let me see you. Unrestricted, got the house now. We gon' turn it up, up, bring the house down. Got that big space pumping, make them bounce now. Blousing like they bossing, and the freaks are coming out now.